This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. Merry Christmas, folks. Christmas is upon us and is the beginning of a new and blessed, most joyful season for the church. And given the spate of bad news and dark news all this past week, let's lighten it up a little bit. No anti-modernist stuff for the Saturday, no hardline teachings. Instead, being that it is a weekend and it is Christmas, let's just have something a little lighter. And so today I present to you an otherwise forgotten piece of writing from G.K. Chesterton called The Old Christmas Carols. I hope you enjoy this. With the approach of Christmas, I have pondered again the problem of why old Christmas carols are so good when most modern Christmas hymns are so bad. The latter is an excruciating enigma in itself, but perhaps one not to be dealt with except delicately in this place. It is not because our religious poetry is necessarily bad. Most of the best poetry in the world was and is still religious poetry. But that does not explain the appalling difference between Marlowe's great description of the red sunset as the blood of Christ streaming in the sky and the actual literary quality of there is a fountain filled with blood. The early carol singers almost invariably had, what the more modern hymn writers emphatically have not, a certain natural carriage and distinction of diction, what we have come to call style. There is an old carol about St. Stephen who was, it would appear, an important official at the court of King Herod. I do not give this piece of information as dogma or part of the deposit of faith or as absolutely binding upon Christian men, nor indeed do I give it as the result of my own historical researches, or as something proved by recent excavations in Palestine, or as the very latest result of the higher criticism, though some of its results are very much more improbable. I accept the poet's assurance that St. Stephen was a clerk in King Herod's Hall, in a certain spirit which is necessary for the appreciation of this very fine sort of literature. The first necessity is to have a certain affection for anachronism. It is right in all religious art that times should be telescoped together. Anachronism is only the pedantic word for eternity. Thus, when the carol says that St. Stephen came into Herod's Hall with the boar's head on hand, it conceived that servitor is as serving up a complete and comfortable Christmas dinner for King Herod. Some will say that this was rather an early meal of the sort to serve, but the same can be found in any really good modern carol, as in one of Mr. Belloc's, where the innkeeper is represented as refusing the Holy Family in the words, Poor folk, said he, must sleep where they may, for the Duke of our elder brothers comes this way, with all his train on Christmas Day. I do not doubt some very learned man at Cambridge has already written to correct this error and point out that Mr. Belloc is probably unaware that Christmas means the Mass of Christ and was not in general use in the time of the Idumean monarch. I have known very learned men at Cambridge write things quite as funny, but this apparent confusion of periods is as deliberate in the modern carol writer as it was as instinctive in the early master of that craft. They really meant that there is a Feast of Herod or of the Duke of our elder brothers, going on all the time, and that there is, in a sense of salutation at Bethlehem, going on all the time. He really meant that a king as bad as Herod might have the boar's head carried before him at any Christmas feast, and when St. Stephen is asked whether there lacketh him food and drink in King Herod's hall, he answers with a certain abruptness, which admirably expresses the deep division between the two things that are always contemporary. Lacketh me neither meat nor drink in King Herod's hall. There is a child in Bethlehem born, is better than we all. There is sort of a logical break, as in consequence, between the first and second couplet, which profoundly conveys the fact that the two things are incommensurate. It is not for him a matter of chronological sequence. It is a question of every man standing like Stephen, conscious that each can coexist with its counterpart and even its contrary. When King Herod was re represented in the medieval miracle plays, he wore the crown of a medieval king, and probably wore it sideways, like the hat of a music hall comedian. He was made a buffoon, but he was made a medieval buffoon, and even a royal medieval buffoon. There was nothing antiquarian about these antiquated persons. They did not try to reconstruct the costume of an Idumean prince under the suzerainty of Caesar Augustus. Yet it was not 
always ignorance. It was sometimes rather a profound and philosophical indifference. They instinctively insisted on the brotherhood of men across the ages. After the artistic truth that is called anachronism, the next artistic quality is what many would call an innocent incongruity. But it is not incongruity, it is rather a comic congruity. It is the art of the grotesque, but many critics forget that the art of the grotesque is an art. Caricature depends on proportion as much as classical design. Even much more frivolous forms of the grotesque illustrate this truth. The mock turtle may be a mixture of different animals, but not a mixture of any animals, or all animals. The Mad Hatter may have a moderately and reasonably mad hat, but he must not have a hat too mad to be recognized as a hat at all. Real people may wear hats of that sort, but unreal people have to be more reasonable. There must be a shape, a design, and a relation in fantastic form. Now, although the old Christmas poets combined many things that sound profane or preposterous to a smug piety, they always combined them with the instinct of sound poetry. There is no proof of this to those who have no sense of what is meant by sound poetry. It will never be demonstrated to people who do not know what poetry is, and it will never need to be demonstrated to people who do not know what it is. But any of the latter will know what I mean when I say that there is an instinctive selection in lines like those about the shepherd. He put his hand under his hood. He saw a star as red as blood. The historical expert will earnestly question whether a shepherd at Bethlehem would have worn a medieval hood. The higher critic will doubt whether there is any real historic evidence for the star of Bethlehem having been bright red. The person who understands these things will simply recognize that he is dealing with a poet. It is the same when, come, when we come to things counted more incongruous. The legendary gifts of the three shepherds are really quite as poetical as the recorded gifts of the three kings. The writer of the medieval carol would doubtless have been mildly surprised if he had read my analysis of his intentions in this article. But so very probably would Shakespeare have been very much surprised if he had read the critical explanations of the purpose of his plays. Or Botticelli have been very much surprised if he had read the artistic analysis of his pictures. It is one thing to be able to do something, and quite another to be able to discuss how it is done. But that does not mean that Shakespeare wrote his plays by accident, or that Botticelli threw his paints anyhow at the canvas. The poet made an instinctive but imaginative choosing when he introduced that thundering on the closed door of the guilty house of Macbeth. The painter made an instinctive but imaginative selection when he introduced a silvery light filtering through the thin plantation of trees seen under the shed of Bethlehem. And the carol writer made an instinctive but imaginative selection when he made the shepherd offer his pipe like a toy to the holy child. Lastly, there is a quality in these medieval songs that can only be expressed by the medieval word lusty. There is a grand and even gigantic gusto, which is never found in modern moral and religious poetry, or only very seldom, and in people of the same tradition. The good news seems to be not only really good, but really new. It is hailed with a sort of shout, not with a mere chorus of congratulation, like a recognized occasion of rejoicing. One of the carols has, far, has for a sort of rowdy refrain the more or less meaningless halloo of a toy, even in reading it on a printed page after 500 years, it is impossible not to have a sort of illusion that we are hearing the loud but distant hail of some hardy shepherd far away upon the hills. If it is ever sung, that chorus can hardly be sung too loud. I will not attempt to inquire here why the medieval carol, as distinct from the modern hymn, could manage to achieve the resounding reality of that shout. I should be inclined to suggest that some part of it may have been due to men really believing that there was something to shout about. But certainly the spirit of Christmas is in these songs more than in any other literature that has since been produced. And if I am forbidden by good taste to express myself in theological terms, I will confine myself to saying in a loud voice, A TOY! <laughs> and there you have it. <laughs> Chesterton reminding us that if there was ever a reason to shout with jubilance and joy, it is this season. Christmas season is upon us, folks, and while I will certainly continue covering... All the bad news in the church involving the modernists and all the rest of it. Let's take, you know, and not forget the reason for our joy. Christmas is upon us. The Lord is born. Let us celebrate. Have a Merry Christmas, folks. God bless.